So this is a moment, really, honestly, that there were many times in my life I never thought would actually happen. Um, and I say that because my brother and I have two other brothers, and we grew up in a very broken home. And the thought of me being a pastor when we were living in the same room together from the time I was born to the time I was 10, and we had bunk beds, and he was on the top bunk, I was on the bottom bunk. The thought of me being a pastor, given what we went through growing up, and him being here to preach is really um, just unbelievable. And uh, I can't believe God has orchestrated our lives to do a ministry. He does a lot of ministry, and um, it's just really unbelievable for me to think about that. God's been good to us. So I'm thrilled and excited for you guys to learn about the historical evidence behind the resurrection of Jesus. So with that being said, will you welcome up my brother, Jeremy Livermore. You want to turn it on? Check, check. Yeah. How you doing? It's good to be here. Um, it's, a, it's really great to be here, actually. I've been looking forward to this as well, and it's always fun to be able to be at a college group, um, and I, I'm sure you realize how special it is to have a group, group like this. Um, not to mention a college pastor like Kev and like Joanna. These guys, they really love you. I just want you to know that. I, Kev talks about you all the time, and I hear all the details of your lives, so I feel like I know you really well. Uh, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I get it all. But um, I know Kevin and Joanna, they really love you, and I, I hope you know that. And uh, so it's a really special to have this while you're in college, and I, I hope you enjoy it and take advantage of it as much as you can. Um, so thank you for letting me come and connect with you. Uh, how many people saw the Spider, uh, Spider-Man, Batman versus Superman movie? How many saw the Spider-Man versus Superman movie? No, okay, there wasn't one. Um, yeah, great entertainment, right? Great entertainment. So I want us to, uh, to think about this question tonight. Was Jesus just a superhero in a Jewish comic book? Was Jesus just a superhero, a super God-man type figure in a Jewish comic book? Was he the Superman of the first century? Were, were the disciples writing about Jesus as if they were writing a comic book? Or were they reporters of history? Were they reporters of history? Did the disciples invent Jesus' resurrection, or did it actually happen? What do I mean? Well, when I was in college, uh, this is way back when Kev was uh, still sucking his thumb, and it's okay, it's permissible. He was, he was still only 15 years old, so it's, it's, it's quite fine. Anyways, when I was in college way back then, I, I almost lost my faith. I almost lost my faith. I came across so many new ideas at the college campus, it made me have so many doubts. And one of the many things that I came across that made me doubt, one of the things, was this idea that there were other dying and rising gods in the ancient Near East, in Persia, in Egypt, and in Greece. And when I heard this, that there was this uh, resemblance to the resurrection of Jesus at that time in these other cultures, it shook my faith. And these were the comic books, if you will, of back then. These were the, the dying and rising gods. They made pictures on the walls uh, of the dying and rising gods, and they, they, they told the story year after year of the dying and rising gods of Persia, Greece, and Egypt. These were their comic books, and these were their comic book superheroes. The skeptics I knew at the college campus were making the case that the story of Jesus was just another comic book of that time. It was just another story of a dying and rising God of that time. The skeptics were saying that the, the, the disciples just wrote another type of comic book superhero story that is just customary for that region of the ancient Near East in the first century. And when I first heard this, my faith was shaken. I started to doubt Christianity was true. How could I know that Jesus' resurrection was different than these dying and rising gods? Well, I went to Cal Poly San Luis Obispo way back then, uh, in, in the last millennium, uh, to date myself. And uh, we had a huge crew movement. At the time, it was called Campus Crusade for Christ. 
And at the time, they had invited several different Christian apologists to come speak at our events. And I discovered something called Christian apologetics. And apologetics just means, it's a Greek word from uh, the Greek apologia, and it just means to give a rational defense of a faith based on evidence. It's, it's like being a, a lawyer in a court case or in a trial, and you provide a defense for why the defendant is guilty or not guilty, why the defendant is not guilty. So um, Christian apologetics was really interesting. So I started to uncover a lot of things I never learned in church that my youth pastor never taught me, that they never talk about on Sunday morning. And what I came to found out, that I wasn't the only one with doubts. Many other college students had doubts too, and many other college students were walking away from the faith. Perhaps some of you already have doubts. In regards to this topic, I learned two important things that set Jesus' resurrection apart from the dying and rising gods. The first thing was the dying and rising gods of the ancient Near East repeated their dying and rising regularly. With every harvest, with every cycle of the, the crops coming and going, the, the gods would rise to new life. And in the fall or the time when the harvest was not good, the gods would be considered dead. And the certain gods would come back and forth depending on the, uh, the performances that they would conduct at their temples and during their, uh, during their rituals. If they did their performance correctly, the god would die and come back to life appropriately each time. So that's the first major difference, that their gods died and rose repeatedly. The second major difference, which is where we will be spending our time tonight, is that the reports of Jesus' resurrection have historical evidence. The reports of the dying and rising gods of the ancient Near East have zero evidence. Zero evidence. So our main idea tonight is this. The historical evidence points to a historical resurrection. The historical evidence points to a historical resurrection. What do we mean by a historical resurrection? Here we're just talking about a resurrection in actual history caused by a supernatural person. So we're not talking about a natural resurrection where somehow uh, Jesus' um, body came back to life in some natural way, where there's this like stored up energy that just happened to find the right alignment and, and the chemicals and the cells just happened to be in the right place where Jesus' body just came back to life. We're not talking about that sort of thing, if that were even possible. No, we're talking about a supernatural resurrection caused by a supernatural person in the same real history that you and I are living in and making now. It was not a comic book resurrection. Why does it matter that it was just, why does it matter that it was historical and not just a comic book fiction? Why can't Christianity just be based on a comic book story? It has to do with Christianity's secret. You could think of it as a secret vulnerability. Consider Superman. Consider his secrets. He's got a few secrets. He's got Lois Lane. He's got his mom in Kansas. And he's got one other very important secret. It has to do with that green rock. What's that called? What happens when kryptonite gets near Superman? He gets weak, right? He gets so weak, his cells just start deteriorating. And you and me could beat him up. In fact, all of our grandmothers could beat him up. He gets really weak. Does Christianity have a similar vulnerable target that if found false, Christianity would be destroyed? Yes, it does. If we read 1 Corinthians 15, 14, Paul says, if the resurrection is make-believe, if it's just comic book fiction, if the events did not happen in history like we think they did, then we all have a serious problem. He says this, if Christ has not been raised, in 1 Corinthians 15, 14, your, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. In verse 17 he says, if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. It's a waste of time. If this one vulnerability is hit just at the right spot, our faith is completely useless. 
What does he really mean by this? He means that if the resurrection did not happen in actual history, Christianity would be completely destroyed and everything would be worthless. Without the resurrection, Jesus is not God, Jesus is not the Messiah, and our superhero is destroyed. And all of the theological doctrines of the last 2,000 years that have filled volumes upon volumes, that have filled up libraries all over the world, uh, thought about by the greatest minds that ever lived, they would all be considered commentaries on a comic book. All of the gospel choirs in the South, all of the beautiful songs they sang, all of the biblical art filling up the cathedrals in Europe, the cathedrals themselves, all of the missionary trips of the last 2,000 years would all be sharing nothing more than comic book fiction, fiction with the world. It would all be a waste of time. Christianity would be completely destroyed if Jesus had not been raised from the grave in a historical manner. If the resurrection is not historical, no one ought to be a Christian. If the resurrection is not historical, no one ought to be a Christian. But if the resurrection is historical, if it actually happened in history, we have what we can think of as a seeing faith, not a blind faith. A seeing faith is something you get after you look at the evidence, after you investigate and you find the evidence. It's not a blind faith. How do we know the resurrection is historical? Wouldn't we need good historical evidence? Shouldn't something so monumental, so earth-shattering, so life-altering like the resurrection be supported by good evidence that everyone can access? Shouldn't the most critical component of Christianity, the, the, one, the thing that supports our faith the most, be supported by evidence that anyone can access and have an easy belief? Anyone can know the resurrection is historical. We have good evidence. In fact, we have overwhelming evidence for the most critical vulnerability of Christianity, turning that vulnerability into our biggest strength. And at this point, I'm sure you're thinking, okay, wait a minute, what about the skeptic who does not take the Bible to be reliable? What about that? Well, even if some skeptic does not take the Bible to be reliable, the historical nature of the core evidences are backed by external, external corroboration written by other ancient historians. Here's just one example of external corroborating evidence outside of the Bible. It's from a non-Christian historian named Flavius Josephus at the time. He says this, at this time there was a wise man who was called Jesus, and his conduct was good, and he was known to be virtuous. And many people from among the Jews and other nations became his disciples. Pilate condemned him to be crucified to die, and those who had become his disciples did not abandon his discipleship. They reported that he appeared to them three days after his crucifixion and that he was alive. So here we have outside external corroboration of the historical nature of Jesus' life, death, and reports of his resurrection. And we have other statements like this from other Roman historians who were no friends to Christianity. And all together we have 17 non-Christian evidences that record the writings of the same events in the writings of Christianity by these Roman historians. And we could piece together all of these things. We know that Jesus um, died, he rose again, and more than that, we know, we know these things. He was the brother of James, he was a teacher, he was a good man, he was a miracle worker, he had disciples, he had fulfilled prophecy, he had people refer to him as a deity had a message that included conversion, denial of the gods, fellowship, and immortality. He was crucified for blasphemy. He reported uh, to have rose again. He was reported to have resurrected. And the disciples were transformed to bold proclaimers of his resurrection. We can know all of that through those guys that just showed up on the screen. Non-Christian Roman historians of the time. The external, non-Christian historical reports directly corroborate the historical nature of the events of the Bible. Now, internally speaking, when just looking at the Bible alone, we can know and we can show 
that the Jesus reports, if you consider them that, are highly reliable and trustworthy and non-contradictory. We don't have time to go into that completely tonight. But one thing to point out is that the reports contain the different vantage points of the biblical authors. They were reporting the same events, but they were emphasizing different things. The different components to the story that they thought their particular audience would, would need to know about the most. So this fact alone, that they, they wrote from different vantage points, is evidence that they were not all getting together to get their story right, to make sure that all their comic books made sense and that when everybody read them, they would get the same exact story. They would be guilty of collusion and we would see through it right away. So we know because they wrote from their different perspectives to different audiences, emphasizing certain things, that they were not trying to write fiction. They were trying to report history as it happened. So externally and internally, we can see that the genre of the reports are his, is a historical genre, and these reports are historical in nature. So let's now turn to the evidence that is accessible to all. We have 12 evidences, and I think you may have a handout with these on your handout. We're gonna look at 12 tonight quickly, but then we're gonna go into four and spend more time on that. So let's look at our 12 evidences. And before we dive into this, just please note that these are evidences recognized by several non-Christian scholars to be historical. Evidence number one, Jesus died by crucifixion. Number two, he was buried in Joseph's tomb. Number three, the tomb was discovered to be empty a few days later by women. Number four, the disciples had experiences of the risen Jesus. Number five, the disciples were transformed as from mourners to bold proclaimers of a resurrection. Number six, the resurrection message was the central message of first century preaching. Number seven, 50 days after the death and resurrection, the message was preached in Jerusalem where he was buried. Number eight, due to the preaching of this message, the church began and grew. Nine, Jewish converts turned to new practices and embraced social changes. 10, James, who had been a skeptic, was converted when he had an experience of the resurrected Jesus. Now, real quick on this one, James, the brother of Jesus, who had been a, a skeptic that he was God in, incarnate, uh, he was converted to the faith later on. He also believed he saw the resurrected Jesus. What would it take for you to believe that your brother rose again? I'm sure a lot. He must have had an incredible encounter with his brother. I can barely believe that Kev takes showers every day, and I would have a really hard time believing that he resurrected. So this is very critical that James, the brother of Jesus, also became a believer in his resurrection. Number 11, Paul, who had persecuted Christians, was converted by an appearance of the resurrected Jesus. Number 12, the disciples died for their beliefs. So those are 12 evidence, evidences that when taken together, they form an overwhelming case that the resurrection is historical. They flow and taken together, one after another, the conclusion that his resurrection is historical is obvious. So must we have all 12? Must we have all 12 to build our case? No, we only need four. And from these four, we can build a case that allows anyone to easily infer that the resurrection is historical. Not only is the resurrection shown to be historical just by four evidences, what's amazing is that these are the four evidences that even the most critical scholars agree to be historical. So we're gonna just use their evidences, just the ones where the most critical scholars are in agreement on. And we're gonna see that even with these four evidences, that the resurrection is historical. Evidence number two, he was buried in Joseph's tomb. Who was Joseph? Joseph of Arimathea was a rich member of the Sanhedrin council. The council participated in the planning of Jesus' condemnation and trial. He wasn't there at the time, but he's a member of that council. We read that he was an upright man and a secret follower of Jesus. He was waiting for the kingdom of God. So Joseph was a good dude. 
And interestingly, archaeological evidence reveals that rich families and prominent Jewish high priests had tombs in that neighborhood just outside of Jerusalem around Golgotha where Jesus was crucified. And this archaeological evidence perfectly corroborates the unimportant and incidental details given in the gospel accounts about Joseph's tomb. In usual circumstances, crucifixion victims were left there to hang on a cross until they died, and they were taken down, and usually they were thrown into mass graves. Many skeptics think that this is what happened to Jesus. But here we have an arrival on the scene of a person named Joseph of Arimathea. He shows up, and he changes the normal course of events that would have taken place for a crucified victim. Skeptics say that the disciples invented Joseph of Arimathea. They did so because it was part of their comic book fiction. This is not possible. Here's why. It's highly improbable that the Jesus reporters would have invented a member of the ruling council to give Jesus a proper burial when all the disciples deserted him. The disciples shamefully didn't even go to the execution of their mentor. They made themselves look bad by not inserting them, themselves into the story. That... To the, as the people that buried Jesus. They made a ruling council member look really good and, and honored him by putting them in their reports. Why did they do this? Because they wanted to tell the truth. The disciples wanted to tell history as it happened, even when it made themselves look bad. They would not have made up a figure that was easily identifiable and recognizable in a certain random spot if they did not want that figure to be questioned. They would have invented somebody from some far off country who took Jesus's body and took, put him in some unknown place if they were just making up comic book fiction. But no, they invented somebody on a ruling council where that's easily identifiable and recognizable. This is as if to say uh, someone on the Dodgers uh, saw Barack Obama uh, trying to panhandle on the street five bucks to buy a cigarette. And we would all go to that guy on the Dodgers and start questioning him. Really? What, where did it happen? How did it happen? Where did you see Obama doing this? So it wouldn't be wise to make up something like that because someone in such a group like the Dodgers or the ruling council of the Sanhedrin would have been easily recognizable and identifiable and anyone could have gone to him for questioning. So we can see that the Jesus reporters placing this historical figure in their report was very important. They did so because they knew their report would stand up to scrutiny. In fact, we have in their report Pharisees who went to this tomb to seal it with Pilate's guards to protect the tomb. So even the rulers who were against Jesus were aware of this tomb that Joseph placed him in. And it's critical that we get this point. It is because we have enemy attestation that he was buried in Joseph's tomb that this evidence is solid. When you have a person on the Sanhedrin and the Pharisees all agreeing that Jesus' body is in that tomb right there, that one, not the other one, that one right there, we have something very important. We have the body in a particular place. We know where it is, and everyone agrees. So now what? Well, he either stays buried, or he does not stay buried. The body is still in that tomb, or it's not in that tomb. If it's not in that tomb, the disciples may have stolen the body. Or something extremely unusual took place. We'll talk about the disciples stealing a body in just a second. Evidence number three. The tomb was discovered to be empty a few days later by women. If you were making up a story, just comic book fiction about your superhero, you would not mention women to be the discoverers of the tomb. Mentioning women in your Jesus report is counterproductive if you wanted people around at that time to believe that your comic book superhero rose from the grave. You see, the women weren't considered to be reliable witnesses in court. In fact, Mary Magdalene, one of the discoverers, was possessed by a demon before Jesus delivered her. So she's definitely not a reliable person that you would want to give the most prominent position to in your story. 
But because they mention the women, we can see that they forced themselves to write the truth as it happened, even if it meant others around at the time wouldn't buy it. Thus, the mention of the women as the discoverers adds to the historical nature of the empty tomb account. What else could explain the missing body in the empty tomb? Is there something else? Well, some skeptics think that the Jewish authorities may have hid the body to keep it from the disciples. But this would have been counterproductive because the Jewish authorities at the time wanted to squash any uprising and any new uh, Christian resurrection doctrine that was coming about. They would have easily just brought out the body that they had hid and say, here's the body, everyone. Jesus is still dead. So you all can stop being Christian right now and just realize that these disciples are crazy. The body is right here. So that doesn't work. Some skeptics say that the body of the dead Jesus was stolen by the disciples. This view was propagated actually by the Jewish authorities at that time, but it also has challenges. First, a large stone was put in front of the tomb. There were guards there, and a Roman seal was placed on the tomb. The guards would have prevented the, the Jewish disciples, uh, Jesus' disciples, from, from coming to raid the tomb. They would not want to get a fight in a fight with these guys. And the guards would not have been sleeping because the guards would have been exposed to severe penalties from their uh, authorities over them. So why were the guards there anyway? The Jewish authorities were actually anticipating that the disciples would come and steal the body. They knew Jesus' predictions about rising from the grave, and they did not want his disciples to come in and steal the body and start this this uprising and start this new movement, start this new faith. So the, the Pharisees went to Pilate and asked for these guards to be put there. In fact, in Matthew 28, 11 through 15, the morning after the resurrection, we come into this story and we see something very interesting happens. Some of the guards went into the city and reported to the chief priests everything that had happened. When the chief priests had met with the elders, and devised a plan, they gave the soldiers a large sum of money, telling them, you are to say, his disciples came during the night and stole him away while we were asleep. If this report gets to the governor, we will satisfy him and keep you out of trouble. So the soldiers came, and they took the body, took the money, and they did as they were instructed. And this story has been circulated, widely circulated amongst the Jews ever um, to this very day. So here we have something really intriguing take place. You can even imagine a possible conversation between a Christian and a, and a Jew at the time. The Christian would have said to the Jew, hey, guess what, Jesus is alive. And the Jew would have said, no, the disciples came and stole the body in the night while the guards were sleeping, and that is why the tomb is empty. The Christian would have said, no, the guard at the tomb would have prevented any such theft and they wouldn't have been asleep. The Jew would have said the guards were asleep. The Christians would have said the, the high priest bribed the guards to say this and the guards actually fainted when there is an angel uh, who came at the time of the resurrection. So the debate about the disciples stealing the body while the guards were asleep is something that has been going on for 2,000 years. In fact, it started the same morning as, of the, as the resurrection. And we've been talking about this, and some skeptics even put this forward as a viable option today. Okay, let's just set that aside for a second. What is very, very interesting here, and obvious about this debate, is that the tomb is empty. And the enemy agrees. In fact, they made up a lie, and now it's debated about what, what's debated is what happened to the body, not that the tomb is empty. Everyone agrees the tomb is empty. This is very important. So the skeptic who says that the disciples stole the body is actually affirming the fact that the tomb is empty. Now, if you, can, if you remember back evidence number two, Jesus' body is in that tomb. Evidence number three, the tomb is empty, and everyone agrees. So as we will see here, 
with the rest of our study, the belief that the disciples stole the body becomes irrational. Hold on to that thought. Evidence number four, the disciples had experiences of the risen Jesus. The disciples had experiences of the risen Jesus. The experience could have either been a hallucination or the actual Jesus. But how could they know that they were seeing Jesus alive? How could they know that it wasn't a hallucination? First, multiple people at different times do not have the same hallucination. Hallucinations are individual, they are subjective, and they are rare. Multiple people don't have them at multiple times. So it could not have been a hallucination as Jesus appeared to various people at different times and some he appeared to more than once. And he appeared in groups of people. In fact, 1 Corinthians 15 says he appeared to 500 people at one time. The second reason why we know that it wasn't a hallucination is because one of the basic abilities of every human being is to know when another human being in front of them is alive. We have this strange ability to know when people are alive and dead. If someone is eating fish for breakfast on the beach of the Sea of Galilee, and he's the same guy that you had the Last Supper with a few nights back, you would know that person is alive. If he's talking to Peter, you would know that person is alive. If he's asking Thomas to come and reach out and touch him, you would know that person is alive. Just because in this particular case, the order is reversed that we typically normally have. Dying people become dead. Um, In this situation, we have death, then life, rather than life, then death. Just because the situation is reversed, it doesn't mean our evidential criteria for knowing life and knowing death needs to be altered. Our ability to know when someone is alive does not change based on a sequence of events. So yes, the disciples were capable, just as we all are, of making human judgments on his aliveness. Therefore, their experiences of Jesus alive is remarkably reasonable and cannot be attributed to hallucinations. Evidence number 12, the disciples died for their beliefs. Another reason why the hallucination hypothesis and the hypothesis that the disciples stole the body are ruled out is because the disciples died for their beliefs. They went to their deaths, not in virtue of their unwillingness, but inability to deny the bodily resurrection. They were not unwilling to deny it. They could not deny it. How could they deny what they knew to be true? Doubt was not possible. They could not deny what they saw, even in the face of death. They would not have died knowing that they raided the tomb and stole the body. They would not have died knowing that they lied to make sense of Jesus' ministry. They would not have died for a hallucination. They would not have died for their comic book success. They were certain that the real risen Jesus was alive in front of them. And we know from independent external sources that all of the disciples died, except for John who was exiled on the island of Patmos off of Greece. We know this from external sources. This external evidence is virtually uncontested amongst even the most critical scholars. In fact, all the most critical scholars try to do is find alternative ways to explain away the reason why the disciples went to their death for this belief. Skeptics say that the the disciples knew that if they died for it, they would go down in history as famous co-founders of a huge religion. They would be famous after death. So that's why they died. This is what the skeptics say. In response to this, we can say that fame and power are completely useless upon death. Dying for a lie is foolishness, and it's absurd. And keep in mind, it wasn't that they were just shot in the back by some assassin that came around with a gun and shot them, and they had a quick death. No, they were tortured. They were tortured prior to death. 
They would have had plenty of time to give up and confess that they made up a lie to sell comic books. They were beaten, imprisoned, tortured, hung, eaten alive, burned to death, beheaded, crucified, stoned, disemboweled, whipped, torn apart, strangled, tossed onto the horns of bulls, had plates of iron pressed onto them. Their dead bodies were later thrown into mass graves. It is absurd to think that Christians from all different walks of life and all different social classes would consent to being tortured and for martyrdom for fame and power. Skeptics also say, so that idea is just ridiculous, that they died for fame and power. Skeptics also say that just as radical Islamic terrorists die today for their belief, it doesn't mean that anyone who dies for their belief, it doesn't mean that that belief is historical. It doesn't mean that that belief is historical. In response, we can say two things. First, what sets the disciples apart is their eyewitness encounters their eyewitness encounters. They were in a unique situation to be eyewitnesses of the supernatural resurrection. Muhammad allegedly had his experience alone. There was no one around to verify that he got his writings from the angel who came to him alone. Suicide bombers cannot have any certainty at all that Muhammad really visited was visited by the angel Gabriel. Why? Because there were no eyewitnesses. There was no evidence. For those, though, who saw the risen Jesus, it wasn't the same type of belief as believing that Muhammad had this spiritual experience with an angel. The disciples empirically satisfied the criteria of knowing. What is the criteria of knowing? Well, knowledge is something that classical philosophers have worked out for 2,500 years. They're still talking about it, but basically the classical view of what knowledge is is called justified true belief. Justified true belief, JTB. If you have a belief that is justified and it turns out to be true that it corresponds with the actual world around you, then you have something called knowledge. You have justified true belief. The disciples were in a unique place to be able to see it with their own eyes, to touch him with their own hands. They were in a unique place to be eyewitnesses of the resurrection. No other religion has such evidence. Second thing we could say about this is that the suicide bombers had everything to gain and nothing to lose when they died. The suicide bombers had riches waiting for them and women in the afterlife. On the other hand, the disciples had nothing to gain and everything to lose. They lived hard lives in poverty, in constant threat of Jewish and Roman assault. They were tortured and killed, as we just discussed. And finally, if they were wrong, it meant eternal damnation in Judaism. Because the disciples were Jews, if they were creating and leading a blasphemous movement that contained lies against God and distortions of God's revelation to Moses, one soul would have been condemned to hell. So the disciples had everything to lose in this life and the next if they were wrong. They did not waver in the face of death. Why? Because they were unable to. They could not deny what they saw. They could not deny what they saw. So we can see that with evidence 12, the disciples died for their belief. We are standing on rational ground. Overall, we can say that with just these four evidences, we have a compelling case for a historical resurrection event. When we add all the 12 evidences in, the certainty grows. 
we can say with confidence that the historical evidence points to a historical res resurrection. The evidence is solid. The case for the resurrection is similar to examples of big legal court cases where the, uh, where the historical evidence points to the historical answer. If we were an unbiased neutral jury as an audience, if we had no predisposition to naturalism, we would eventually easily conclude that the historical evidence points to a historical resurrection. Anyone with access to this evidence would easily conclude the same thing, that Jesus resurrected from death. Christianity's biggest secret is based on solid evidence, turning that secret vulnerability into our biggest strength. So what does this all mean? Well, what really intrigues me about the resurrection is something that we can all relate to. We can all relate to this. One day we will resurrect like him. One day we will also resurrect to be with him. One day we will worship him. In a moving passage in John 20, Jesus invited the skeptical Thomas to prove for himself the reality of his transformed body. Thomas had a narrow epistemology at the time. He was nicknamed the Doubting Thomas. Thomas was li a lot like me, maybe like you. He had a lot of doubts. In fact, he was worse. He spent three years with Jesus and he would not believe the reports of his friends who told him that Jesus rose from the grave. He said, I need to see with my own eyes and touch him with my own hands in order for me to believe. And Jesus says, when he appeared in that same room with Thomas, he said to Thomas, put your finger here into my hands. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting, Jesus told him, and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Thomas was stricken. Thomas was undone. Thomas knew it was true. Jesus completely satisfied Thomas's skepticism. His doubts were resolved. The barriers to belief came down. This is huge. I was once a doubting Thomas. And maybe if you don't have doubts now, maybe you will in the future. Can I tell you that doubts are natural? It's okay. Don't be afraid of doubting. Doubts are okay as long as you are willing to see it through and look at it from all sides. And when you find that you are doubting, talk to Pastor Kevin and Joanna. Look up the word apologetics in Google. Look it up. In fact, I volunteer and I've worked for this organization called Apologetics.com. We have a website. That's the name, Apologetics.com. We have radio shows, podcasts, articles, things of this nature. And I want to expose you to this word, apologetics, because it may be something that saves your faith too. Look it up, type it in when you have those doubts. This is very important, friends. Thousands upon thousands of Christians that come through high school youth groups are losing their faith, are walking away from faith, the faith their first year in college. 75%, I've looked at 25 studies, 75% of college students on average lose their faith in college because they do not know that their faith is based on evidence. They do not know their faith can be thought of as something to be rational. Our faith is rational. It's based on evidence. Will you pray with me? God, we just thank you tonight for this chance to be here, to think about this evidence that you provided us, to help us to think differently about our faith, to know that we can have a seeing faith and not a blind faith. God, and we pray that you would reveal to us your reality, 
Lord, that you would help us to know that we could reach out and touch you when we're not sure. And when we're not certain, we can know that you are there and that you will provide the answers. That you can resolve all of our frustrations, all of our doubts. That you can bring the solution if we are willing to look. God, we offer you our minds. Lord, to think critically about our faith. Lord, to know that you can answer every question because you are an incredible God and you did not leave us hanging. You gave us something that we need. You showed us the truth. God, make it real in our hearts and make it real in our minds. In the name of Jesus.